we're going to do lots of spiritual things time for okay. something before, before we get too into the uh, football. Oh, I have to say to you, we did mass deliverance last night with all our church. I was so excited. I love mass, the kicking of demons. I love people getting free. I love the wild noise of the demons coming out. Uh, I particularly love that because the demons screamed when Jesus delivered them. So I kind of feel like if they screamed when Jesus delivered them, they should jolly well scream when we delivered them. And I love that. I love the blood curdling sound of a demon coming out because you know that sound is that demon in pain when it's being displaced from its home. And so the noise of deliverance ministry just, I mean, I jump up and down on the spot with that because as, as you saw last night, uh, so um, just the sheer thrill of noisy church, because when you're noisy like that, you know that you're in the deep waters of liberation. Uh, so somebody saying, is there a demon of cholesterol? I don't, I don't know that I've ever delivered a demon of cholesterol. <laughs> That's a brilliant eat so much butter. <laughs> I don't know. We're back right to the iron brew. Anyway, uh, so that it, so, uh, but we were actually uh, Nicola and uh, and uh, Luke and I, the three of us, Nicola and Luke and I, uh, then went down to the hospice very late at night and spent uh, two hours just singing and worshiping over our uh, our member family member who has got cancer, Paul, and uh, and then Nicola. Nicola, I love the supernatural. Realm. Nicola grabbed this scalpel in the spirit that we could see in her hands in the spirit. And she's like in the spirit realm, cutting out the cancer. And I mean, you could see the whole thing happening. Brilliant, 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 cutting out the cancer. And then she said, um, oh no, my fingers are glued together. God has glued my fingers together with this scalpel in her hand. So your husband, Deb, is pulling her fingers apart <laughs> and they won't come apart. She's like, God's welded this scalpel to my fingers. So I'm like, you mustn't be finished. You have to ask what else you need to do. So of course there was more cutting. And as soon as she'd finished the cutting, she was able to set the scalpel down. But I love that. I love that what we do in the spirit realm and those prophetic acts and our engagement in the realm of the supernatural actually has a level of impact on the natural. And she genuinely had a, a spiritual scalpel in her hands, but had a physical manifestation of not being able to, to open her fingers. And it kind of reminded me, I know it's not on the theme of what we're discussing today, but it reminded me of the time uh, when Jessica, my daughter said to me, she came in and her hands were up like this. And she said, I was worshiping Jesus. How old did she mean? She mean quite little. I can't put my hat, I can't put my hands down. This is just in the house. And David and I are like prizing the hands down. And literally all the strength of her mom and dad and God had just set her arms in a place of praise and she was immovable. Um, so uh, I've seen you like that where, you, where the, the Sarah Jane, the spirit has pinned you to the floor until you gave birth in the spirit realm and you couldn't move at the, yeah. the front of churches. No, yes, very convenient. Yeah, when you say to God, I'll give you anything, I'll do anything, Lord, he really does take you at your word. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, the places that you get stuck in the spirit or, or on the floor when the Lord says, get down, and then you can't get back up. Um, you know, um, I love that, though. I love that God did that with Nicola. Um, because even, I was thinking yesterday in staff time, there was a word about scalpel. Oh, was it yesterday yes. morning? Yes, yes, about scalpels. And so the manifestation of that so quickly coming to reality as we pray in the spirit. And this is the thing. We have to not just seek first the kingdom. We have to see first the kingdom. And then we'll see it in, in the natural. And this is where the Lord is taking us. I love, I love that. I mean, we could go on for probably a whole hour about the demonic story. tongue burn and stories of manifestations in the natural. Read my book to see that story. It's coming out yeah. soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the demonic talk and um, but that sense of the um yeah the just amazing ways that god manifests yes love it. one of my one of my and De i don't know whether debs and katrina you have stories like this but one of my favorites was um in one of our first buildings all i could hear was sarah jane help help I'm like, oh no come on <laughs> help 
<laughs> so we're we're following the story drones. of a groaning Sarah Jane, and God had um, the glory had come at the at the doorway of the cubicle into the toilet, and uh, right. I think your head was like nearly at the toilet bowl. It was. So it was almost to the toilet. God has pinned me to the floor. So yes. Not even convenient, and all not of the even. girls are like. Fortunately, I hadn't locked the door, though, right? Fortunately, I hadn't locked myself in. My feet were still out. My feet were still out in the corridor, so that was good. <laughs> we're, we're all in. The girls are all pinned, you know, into the same toilet cubicle. God, what are you doing? We're meeting you by the toilet pan, you know. And I've got my head on the floor. I literally, I'm not kidding. I had this red line across my forehead when I got up after that time. Because my, my head was so pinned to the floor and God was shaking me so much. I got like, <laughs> I got like friction burn on my forehead. <laughs> and Emma, I remember you, you went out to a meeting and you're like to the team, sorry guys, I've got to leave you, SJ, sorry. You know, God, do what you need to do. And off she goes, flounces out. And I, I'm left pinned to the floor going, oh God, I don't know. Managed to crawl myself to another room, I think, after that. Yes, that was a few years ago now, but there's been many since. There has. Do you, have, do you have stories like that before we prophesy? I mean, I don't think any stories could rival being pinned to the bathroom floor or <laughs> a black tongue. So no. may, I guess the, the dangerous prayer is, Lord, I look forward to the day where I do get to tell stories like that. But that's that's a risky, risky thing to say out loud with witnesses. Yes. No. yes. It, it, it was, um, in America. Um, ministering and he was um, pinned to the floor after leading worship couldn't move his arms and legs they did not move so he was actually taken to the emergency room for a cat scan <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> because of the glory of god yeah i mean and he just he spent like a whole a whole day there he was fine and then um, he eventually got movement back when what he was what was done needed to be done. But yeah, he um, he ended up in the emergency room. That is brilliant, Katrina. You have an amazing uh, prophetic word. Jump in. The floor is yours, Katrina Chase from Portland, Oregon. But ten years in Scotland. Hit us with it. Oh, you're yeah. muted. Oh, am I okay? Um, so this morning I was in the spirit and just asking Holy Spirit, you know, what word do you want to bring? And I saw Jesus pacing as the lion. And I don't often see Jesus as the lion quite agitated. And so I was asking Holy Spirit questions, you know, why is Jesus ad agitated? And it went from this Holy Spirit pace, you know, Jesus pacing back and forth. And then I could see him weeping. And so I was like, oh my goodness, what do I do? What do I say? How, how do I approach Jesus? And almost, you know, we want to bring comfort to Jesus. And so again, asking Holy Spirit questions and Jesus was saying, he turned to me and just was such just such a look in his face. He said, Katrina, I'm weeping because I have bound my hands to the faith of the church and I have bound my hands to their voices. And I just stood there stunned and because I understood what he meant in that moment is that he was agitated because he was waiting for our faith to be activated. He was agitated because he was waiting for the voices of the saints to be raised in prayer and petition and speaking wow. out the truths of scripture. And I didn't watch Power Hour until um, Tuesday's Power Hour until after I had prepped. And so that Ephesians 6, 18 um, passage is what came to me as well. And it was interesting. That's what you guys spoke about. But that idea of praying in the spirit at all times. And Jesus was saying, you are to pray in the spirit. And then Jesus led me to what looked like a balcony in the heavenlies to look down on earth. And I could see just all the peoples of the earth. And there were very few that were genuinely set with their eyes looking in the spirit, set with their eyes looking. As we know in scripture, it says, fix your eyes on the things unseen. And it was so sad to see that too few truly had their eyes fixed on the things unseen. And as I look back to Jesus, I could see his heart and I could see in him the weight of just the peoples that are still in captivity and just different people groups and demographics. And he said, Katrina, I am groaning with the agony of carrying these people that I want to bring to the place of deliverance. And I want to bring them to that place of freedom. And as I could see in the spirit behind me, just countless angels just waiting to be activated. And again, that sense of Jesus saying, I have bound 
my voice and I have bound my hands to your faith. And even the angels are waiting for us to activate our faith. They're waiting for us to see in the spirit and to pray in the spirit and to be dispatched. And what was even sadder was then Jesus took me to different rooms and I could see all of these different rooms, um, armories in the spirit with different weapons and weapons of warfare. And I got excited thinking, this is it. This is how we bring deliverance. I can see the weapons that we need to bring deliverance to nations and people groups. And he said to me, Katrina, they're not ready to receive it. If I was to give out these weapons in this age, the church would use it against itself. She wouldn't use it against her true enemy. And that sense of Jesus saying, I know that we say it over and over again, and we've said it a lot in World Prayer Watch, but it is a season to truly know who our one enemy is, and that is the kingdom of darkness. And so we just bring that weighty word and we have that sense of we weep with Jesus, but we have to do business with Jesus and say, Lord, in myself, where I have seen humanity as my enemy, rather than the true enemy being Satan in the kingdom of darkness, I repent for that. And even, you know, Emma was talking about the mass deliverance that we did last night as a church. And that had to do with mindset and needing the mind of Christ. And if we're to use our voices and in a, in a sense, unbound the hands of Jesus, then what we need to do is we need to have the mind of Christ to pray in the spirit at all times. And so just that idea of just, I can, it's so hard to articulate. You can feel the agony of Jesus and I can feel the desperation in Jesus of, I want these people groups. I want these demographics. I want these nations and tribes to come into the kingdom of heaven, but I'm waiting and pacing the throne room for the, the church to stand as she needs to stand. And there's a very sobering thing that Jesus said towards the end of this encounter, which is, I will find those that have eyes to see and I will capture the remnant unto myself and we will move forward as the remnant. We will move forward as the army of the heavenlies and they will be those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. But woe unto those who do not listen to that and woe unto those who do not fix their eyes on the things unseen for they will be left behind. Not that you use, lose your salvation, that is not at all what I'm talking about, but to be those who make history, to be those who set nations free and entire people groups free. It is to be those that have eyes to see and ears to hear and listen and be in step with the Lord. And he just said, I'm looking for those that are totally obedient and totally yielded to what I give them as their marching orders. And I could see in the spirit twos and threes that were just shining white hot with the purity of holiness. And the Lord saying, I'm sending you into the darkest places. And for me, he gave me particular people, groups and demographics that he knows I, I have a heart for. And just saying, I will send the twos and the threes into the dark places because they're not afraid of what the enemy carries in those places. They understand who they are and they understand the weight of glory that displaces that. But it is sad to see that it's the twos and threes rather than a mass movement into those places. And so that's um, just that idea of the weight of the sobering weight of just Jesus sitting and grieving and pacing in anticipation, the church and those that would see in the spirit and pray in the spirit and from the spirit, as we keep saying. Yeah, Katrina, that's incredibly powerful. And I want to just pull out a couple of thoughts there that God is bound to our faith levels uh, and God is bound to our level of action. Now, that is so biblically on it. And uh, it, look, I'm going to be really straight with you guys. We have had moves of God and we have had revivals that were sovereign and I have heard the Lord say in recent years, I will not do it like that again. And the danger is we are praying for a sovereign download. Oh God, you just come and meet with me. And we know that in the days of the Toronto blessing, it almost didn't matter who the prayer team member was. God was just going to come sovereignly and knock everyone over and impart straight from heaven into their lives. It is not that day. It is not the day to contend for a revival that will look like it looked yesterday. And we still are. And the Lord is saying, no, 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 no. It's going to be a co-laboring move. It is going to be a move that I do with you and through you and in you and your levels of action and your levels of faith and your levels of listening and your levels 
of holiness will dictate how this goes. And still we don't change. And still we contend for something sovereign. And you are right back into Amos 3, which, of course, prophets quote all the time. Surely the sovereign Lord does no good thing without first revealing it to his servants, the prophets. In other words, God says, I limit myself to what you will hear and what you will believe and what you will action And the fact that we did mass deliverance last night and it, it was utterly gloriously spectacular, that is not because we all stood there um, with our hands in our pockets and God sovereignly kicked out demons. That was because we co-labored and went after it. And sometimes you really have to say, actually, you have a demon that you don't know. I'm going to get it. And then they're a puddle on the floor. And I think that's what you're saying, that God is bound to our faith. Therefore, you and I must pray, God, raise my faith. If you are tying yourself, God, into co-laboring, otherwise, how will the bride ever be ready? If you are tying yourself into co-laboring, I've got to come up in my faith levels. God, raise my faith. Does that summate what you're feeling, Katrina? Yeah, and I think the other word that comes to mind is responsibility, that we as Christians carry the weight of responsibility, that oftentimes, like you said, it's easy to say, Lord, you move sovereignly, you move, you do these things for me and to me and around me, and we miss the point that I am the hands and the feet of Christ. And it is my voice that he uses in a moment to speak out the heavenly truths and the heavenly realities. And we're seeing that, you know, in our intimate family as we're praying for Paul, that it takes all of us taking responsibility as faith-filled believers to stand as warriors in the gap and say, not on our watch. And I think yes. too many Christians, we want to participate and we want to just be spoon fed things. And we're realizing, you know, there's a reason we use the language of military and army that takes training, that takes discipline, that takes participation, and that takes a level of responsibility. And we hear the stories of encounter, you know, even us telling our silly stories of encounter on a bathroom floor, but that takes a willingness to be uncomfortable at an inconvenient time for the move of God to come in us and through us so that he can manifest the kingdom of heaven in our place. But again, this is themes that are swirling around and it's not new information. If we're the embodiment of Christ and we're the holy temple, that means I have to move and act and be the holy temple wherever God wants me to be that. And he has bound himself to me going into the grocery store and using the word of knowledge gifting or going into the gym and saying, this is my territory that I'm claiming for the kingdom of heaven. And I'm active in participating in that. And I'm going to use my voice. And then I'm, I'm going to say, Lord, build my faith to see this demographic as sons and daughters of the most high God that are just caught in darkness and I'm going to pull them out with the Holy Spirit by seeing in the spirit. And so again, it takes that exercising of the muscle of everywhere I go, I'm looking in the spirit, even at the gym, even at the grocery store, even as I'm driving around, Lord, what's happening? Why is that person behaving in that way? Why is that person rude to me and seeing in the spirit rather than reacting in my flesh and saying, well, then I choose to bless them according to the spirit of kingdom of heaven, because that's a manifestation of their torment at the hands of the demonic. And so I'm going to see that. And, you know, like again with Nicola, with this, the scalpel slice through spirit and flesh and say, well, I bless that person to come into the kingdom of heaven, but I'm also recognizing I, they need to be dealt with the kingdom of darkness that's around them. That's holding them captive. That's very good. Des, I'm going to come to you because you, you have something to build on this, uh, where we talk about out of, you were talking about out of our feelings and into our faith. Can I just say, when I've done this with my children, um, uh, particularly my youngest, uh, um, who's 13, uh, is it tough? It's tough going to school in this environment. And what I would say to him is, you know, those who are mean to you, those who are nasty, I want you to see why in the spirit realm, do not, Samuel Stark, react out of, oh, well, they are a bit mean and they're a bit off and they're a bit rude and they're a bit difficult. Tell me, Samuel, which one of your friends has been sexually abused? Tell me, Samuel, 
which one of your friends is, is physically abused, look in the spirit and see what level of fear is on their life. Read them in the spirit realm. Don't, don't come to me uh, with a sob story if you haven't seen their life from the perspective of God and in the spirit. And so Samuel, I mean, it's a lot for a 13 year old, but we've been doing this for years. Oh, well, that one is self-harming. I can see that demon behind them. And that one is, you know, physically abused. And, and what does he do? He turns their life around. He's 13 years old. And he says, you come to my house because my house is safe. And I come down and one of them doesn't have a lot of food and he's got beans on toast out of the cover because that's the only thing he knows to make at 13. And he's serving and loving people who are really mean to him and turning their lives around because he's seen in the spirit and has applied his faith and not responded just out of you know his, his flesh. And that God is turning these children's lives around because as you said, God is bound to our faith levels. God is bound to our spirituality levels, uh, uh, Debs. Yeah. And you can feel, you can really feel the weight of that and um, the emotion in, in the heart of God that he's just, he's purse ready, ready to go. And he's, he's looking at us. And I, I just heard him say, um, on the back of what Katrina said, you know, you need to get out of your feelings and into your faith. There's a word. And and I that what you were just saying, get that eternal perspective, fix your eyes on Jesus, look into eternity, get your faith, get your hope and get in the timing of God to fully recognize who the enemy is that's bound us. Because um, as Katrina was speaking, I, I clearly heard the spirit of God say it's time to sack the devil. It's time to, to fire um, the one that that you've been consulting, you've been consulting the wrong source to to find out how we partner with the spirit and what our future like looks like. And I think so much we remain in our emotional dysfunction. And what you were saying yes. there about, about the mind of Christ, mm -hmm. we stay in that place of surrender in our mind, and it's actually preventing us for for reaping in this new season because we've never sown. Yeah. And and that and wow. that play, we spend time collecting evidence to keep us in a place that isn't actually the reality of where we are in Come the on. spirit with God. Mm -hmm. And and I heard him say, why, why do you need to be in a good mood? Why do you need to be in a good mood to fully follow me and and to align your faith to to my plans? And you know, we have many internal storms we have many but we sometimes have to go against our feelings in order to live in freedom we have to go against our thoughts and have the mind of christ to live in peace because these imaginary scenarios are we are partnering with the enemy a very real enemy and imagining scenarios that are keeping us from like Katrina said, we are looking for reasons, checking in with how we feel that actually is in, it contradicts our responsibility. Very good. Of, of what we have and, and where we are. And, and you know, I, I just feel that just because it's God's timing doesn't mean it's good timing. And I think so often we sit in a place of waiting for when the, when this happens, when this happens, that'll be the right time. When God does this, this will be the right time. And you hear the phrase batted about all the time. God's always on time and God's always in time. But whose time? You know, yeah. and, and and, you know, look at Lazarus. He didn't heal him before he died. Yeah, He waited four days and the miraculous was in the fact that he was dead first and that was God's timing. And just because it looks like bad timing doesn't mean it's not God's timing. And I hear him saying, do you trust me to leave you in that storm? Do you trust me to leave you there the full four days? And we don't. We're screaming, get me out, get me out. But while I complete the work in order for your faith to align with me in the spirit? Do you trust me to leave you there so that I get 
the right version of you, a one that reflects who I am. That's so powerful. And it's pushing that thought, Debs, isn't it, of, well, if I'm going to do something majestic for God, I've got to feel Holy Spirit goosebumps. I've got to feel righteous enough. I've got to feel fasted and prayed up enough. I've got to feel a certain way before some spiritual things will happen. Mm -hmm. Since when was this faith journey based on how I felt in a moment? Exactly. Why on earth do we enshrine that? which is nonsense. And I love that sense of, God, would you work to my calendar, my diary? I mean, now is a good time for a miracle. And God's saying, no, 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 no. I'm actually going to leave some things till you're, you know, uh, yep. grown up by the process or I'm going to come earlier, you know, and actually God's timing is largely uncomfortable. God is an uncomfortable God and God is very happy with our uncomfortableness because our uncomfortableness keeps us dependent yeah and if you get too comfortable start to worry there should be an uncomfortableness that we continually live on that keeps us <gasps> dependent on god mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sir jane you have great thoughts on god is demanding all of us which is really what we've been building to take us take us there mm -hmm. so good this exercising of ourselves in faith, this exercising of ourselves in the seeing and the hearing and the being present with the Lord and his timing is so where it's all at. And we are in this time, the Lord said even yesterday to me and he showed me the glory era is upon us, is upon the people of God. But in this place of the glory era being manifest on the earth, as we go deeper into it, the only way the Lord said that you, will survive is this you must have understanding it this is no longer an option you must have understanding and you must have wisdom and where does this come from it comes from the place of seeking God and we see that all the way peppered through scripture when Isaiah is given a word by the Lord you know those who basically have eyes and ears to see and hear will not in Isaiah 6, we see that repeated again in Matthew 13 and Acts. Um, now, where is it in Acts? Let me just get the right reference because I don't want to. It, it's Acts 28. Acts 28, when G Jesus and Paul are saying at that point, there may be those who have no eyes to see and no ears to understand in accordance with the Isaiah 6 word. But you, you, Jesus said, have been given the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. It has been given to you. And so there is this space where we have to acknowledge as the people of God, some of us know what it means to go after understanding and others of us are going, I have no idea where to start. Because if God is saying, I must have you and I must have you with understanding, then we have to be those who know how to go after that. We have to be those who know how to exercise our faith in, in receiving understanding. Psalm 53, 2 says, God looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Yeah. And it's the seeking of God that brings understanding. It's the seeking of the knowledge of him that brings wisdom and understanding of him and to him. And it's that place of being in Christ so much that as we seek the Lord, we understand what he's doing like Jesus did so that we can partner with it at that time. And like Debs was saying there, this, this gap of God, I know you're doing something and I need to exercise my faith. But how are we exercising our faith? Are we exercising it in action in that moment? Or are we exercising that faith in being still and trusting the Lord and saying, Lord, I am trusting you in this gap. I am trusting you in this moment because I'm seeking understanding. Um, but at this, this, this was interesting. Just even as the credits opened actually for Power Hour this morning, I saw in the spirit and the, and the, uh, the doors of understanding opening. And we have to acknowledge in the spirit that God is saying, look, there is no option now, church. You will not survive the future. You will not survive, if you will, tomorrow what is coming of the tensions of the world. 
understanding is no longer optional. The wisdom of God is no longer optional. We have to be those who go after understanding. And for me, this is really epitomized in the story of Stephen, actually. And it's it's the most glorious, glorious thing in Acts 6 and 7 to see Stephen stand up for the gospel and to stand against the religious leaders. And this is when the glory of God is manifesting, when we face off the religiosity of the era and the glory of God is revealed in the moment of persecution. But he is the one who goes after understanding like never before. He goes after seeking after God. And actually, who has prayed that? Let me be like Stephen, because Stephen's the one who got stoned. Stephen's the one who died. But listen to this. Then Acts 6, 10, religious leaders, they were not able to resist. <laughs> they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke because he spoke from a place of seeking God and seeking understanding. And I think there's so much more we could say on that, but I think I would encourage us all, where, wherever you are on this journey with the Lord, whether you're a baby Christian, whether you're a mature Christian, it's time to buy oil of wisdom. It's time to buy wisdom by seeking the Lord like you've never done before, because we cannot afford not to. Wow, very helpful. Uh, Debs and Katrina, who would like to comment on what Sarah Jane has said? This push to seek and contend for wisdom and understanding in the mind of Christ. I think just as, as Jay was saying that, what came to mind is we, especially in the Western church, need to come with humility and say, I need to recognize that I perhaps have misunderstood scripture because I read it in an English translation that isn't its original context, that isn't its original language, and just that sense of becoming learners again of the scriptures that our, our understanding begins and is founded on scripture and an absolute passion and all-consuming hunger for more of the scripture and understanding of it. And I mean, I've had the privilege of going to seminary and doing a bit of Greek and Hebrew. And can I say, when you start to see the scripture in its original language, it unlocks so much yeah. of what you thought you understood. You read scripture and you're like, I thought I understood that what that meant, but I realized I completely misunderstood it because what it means in the original language, what it means to the original listeners and hearers is vastly different. And that's a journey I think us at GP have been on is being exposed to different authors and content that is completely radicalized and re-emphasized that the spirit realm from cover to cover is all over scripture. I think there's a lot in the Western church where we think, oh, well, if we're true Bible believers, that undermines spirituality, that those two things are in opposition, when in reality, scripture is a huge mm -hmm. proponent of the spirit realm. And, you know, the early church and Abraham and the desert fathers knew the spirit realm. You know, it wasn't the surprise to mm -hmm. Abraham yeah. to speak to the three angels. It wasn't a surprise to Moses, yeah. you know, to encounter these heavenly beings or Isaiah. And we are the ones that are like, oh my goodness, this is really weird. And we shut the doors of understanding because it makes us uncomfortable. And that's the point where God has, has us is he swung wide that door of understanding. But am I willing to admit, I think I've learned incorrectly and I need to relearn my scripture in a way that ushers me safely into that place of revelation into, you know, safely into the spirit realm. And that's why I want to say, you know, for people that maybe this, weirds them out and they think, well, when you talk about the spirit realm, isn't that the new age? Isn't that that? Well, everything of the kingdom of darkness is first and foremost a counterfeit and a stolen product yes. of the kingdom of heaven. We should be the ones that know what it is to walk mm. in the spirit, to see in the spirit, to talk to angels and divine heavenly beings. We should be the ones that that's just, that is our normal. You know, why do we call it supernatural when that's our natural state of being? That's what yes. we were naturally created to be. And so I just go back to scripture and reread it and, and find those resources that help you understand that. Because this is where we're moving as a church. This is how we bring heaven to earth and really manifest the kingdom of heaven. Debs? And um, the, the reality of accepting that I am guilty of un fully understanding his word and who he is through the mindset and culture of who I want him to be and how I want him to look and how I think he should, just like Sarah Jane said, how he should 
manifest at this moment in time and my, the gap to action that I have as a result of my choice of lack of understanding and um, because I am not fully submitted to partnering with him in the spirit and actually having a true and real revelation and understanding of who he is. Yeah. Let me just prophesy and share what I feel like the Lord's been saying to me for the last 24, 36 hours and some of the stuff I did with my own uh, church last night. The Spirit of the Lord is saying there is an invitation to a new level of burning. There is an invitation to the fire. And the Lord says, you have contended for fire before. And the Lord says, I have burnt many of you, but you have stood on the outer coals. And there is a central place in the heart of my fire of red hot consuming. And the Lord says this to you, I need to burn your decision making. I need to burn your emotions. I need you to look at your relationships. I need you to review your revelation for the spirit of the Lord says you have been contaminated by the world you have been contaminated by your culture you are navigating your decisions by cultural standards too much says the Lord and there is mixture in the church and the spirit of the Lord says you have put political opinion and biblical truth and fused them when they are separate. You have theology and mythology. You have culture and scripture all jumbled up together. You have merged your thinking of faith with the thinking of your culture. And the spirit of the Lord says you need to come church into a place where your emotional processes are decontaminated for the Lord says I need a church who see rightly who think rightly who emotionally steward rightly who do not filter their prophetic words by their cultural preferences and the spirit of the Lord says it is the days of the mind of Christ it is the days of the mind of Christ it is the days of the possession of the mind of Christ in your body it is the days of the eyesight of Christ it is the days of the full emotional spectrum of Christ being your emotions and the spirit of the Lord says holy ones that's you by the way holy ones arise those who think and feel and act like me says the Lord for the spirit of the Lord says you are to understand things as Jesus did you are to have the thoughts of the Messiah says the Lord and I am burning your worldly principles out of you says Christ and the Lord says I want to teach my church to think again and the Lord says, oh, church, you must humbly recognize that you are in a limited place. And the Lord says, I am waging warfare on your preconceived notions. I am waging warfare on your political opinions. I am waging, war oh, not somebody else's political opinions, your political opinions. I am waging warfare on your judgments, your bias, your woundedness, your concealed opinions, your hardness of heart to others, your numbness, your opinions that you think are fact. The Lord says, I am fed up of you quoting the verse that we move from one degree of glory to another, but for a whole generation, says the Lord, you have not shifted as a corporate body one step of glory. You quote glory to glory, says the Lord, but you have not accessed it. And Western church, you are stuck between glory levels because you are in the constraints of Satan who is teaching you how to think more than I am teaching you how to think. Oh, you need an overhaul of the mind of Christ. And the spirit of the Lord says, I will burn your brains. I will burn your brains. I will burn your thinking, says the Lord, that you may think and see and behave as a Christian should. And that is, yes, seeing in the spirit, but that is a mindset that isn't 
is shaken. And the Lord says, you are mentally and emotionally too easily shaken. And I know that's true. I mean, we all put our hands up to that. We are more emotionally shaken than we should be. And yet we should have the mind of Christ. This is not for somebody else. I'm talking to you. And the spirit of the Lord says, why did you think that I put fire on the heads of the disciples at Pentecost? The Lord says, you did not see me burn their heart. You did not see me burn their guts. I chose fire on the head at the birthing of the church. For the spirit of the Lord said, they would not have stewarded the new thing had I not burned their thinking. The spirit of the Lord said, yes, I put power in their hands to lay on and heal. I put power in their communication. But the spirit of the Lord says it was a burning of their heads and their brain and their mind and their thinking that enabled them to transition into the new. And the spirit of the Lord says, I am the brain burning, mind altering Holy Spirit. And the Lord says, church, you need mind altering, but you need it done by me. Let me keep going, ladies, and then you can pray the demons out. I'll get to the point where we pray. You're all about to get delivered, by the way. And the Lord says this. We are in the verse where deceiving spirits and devils have indoctrinated us. That's First Timothy Four, verse one, the Lord says, my church is being indoctrinated by the doctrine of devils. We are believing what Satan says. And the spirit of the Lord says this. And some of you are going, no, 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 no. I mean, I've not been indoctrinated by a devil. Yes, you have. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm secure. A devil has not taught me. What nonsense. Because if you partner with self-rejection or you have self-loathing in your being, if you think you're ugly, if you can't hear the report of the Lord, you're in the doctrine of the devil. If you can't hear, well done, good and faithful servant. If you are so wound up by duty and perfectionism and false responsibility and an unhinged demonic work ethic, you are indoctrinated by devils. And the Lord is saying, beware the demons who have feasted on your brain. Beware the demons in your mind who have devoured your ability to think well and to think your way out of situations. Beware the demons who have robbed your mind where robust thinking is consistently hard to find. And the spirit of the Lord says, like octopuses with tentacles who leech on, so there are demons that I need to burn off your head who have controlled your generational line with substandard thinking, substandard action, substandard legacies. The Lord says these mind altering demons are even stewarding how nations think. And the spirit of the Lord says, beware the demons who have seeded generational thinking. And I saw demonic larvae down family lines that would be birthed in you at, uh, uh, at the point of your conception and they would consume your thoughts and they would incapacitate you and that many of you are in generational mindsets of captivity. And the spirit of the Lord says, it is time to stop being eaten by demons from the inside out for you have taken on the mannerisms of Satan by having more of the thought processes of hell than the thought process is heaven and the spirit of the Lord says it is time to heal and deliver generational mindsets and for the church to say I have the mind of Christ oh, 
And the spirit of the Lord says, I am birthing a remnant and it's going to be painful. But these are the days of Gideon. These are the days where it's small numbers because many will be scared. Many will be risk averse and walk away from the faith. But the spirit of the Lord says, remnant, remnant, remnant. You can say, that's me. That's me. Remnant. He says, the battle of this era is to go against Satan in one key line where he wants to put a wall between the natural and the spiritual. Satan wants to alienate you from the spirit realm. He wants to shut down your visions. He wants to rob your dreams. He wants to diminish your revelation. He wants to stop you working miracles. He wants to stop you casting out demons. And the enemy is shouting, neuter the remnant, neuter the remnant from their supernatural thoughts. And the spirit of God is, oh, mind of Christ, come in that place. Oh, mind of Christ invade where we're cynical and skeptical and unhinged and blown off course about supernatural things. This is the deliverance of the moment. Sarah Jane, Debs and Katrina, we've got a few minutes. We're going to go over time. Just kick those demons out. Get rid of those generational demons. Get rid of those things for us. Sarah Jane, go for it and just start to knock them out of people's minds. So I encourage you right now to get your hands on your heads and just respond to that word of the Lord. I have the mind of Christ is the declaration over our minds, Lord. Come and burn right Right now those demonic larvae and some of you are going to see that as soon as you pray that prayer it was like as i was doing it last night i was catching up in bed on the on the word and i'm like oh my goodness get those things off me right now in jesus name and um, i have the mind of christ and so be aware we loose the fire of god to every demonic larvae everything that is generational in its origin Everything that is on your timeline in your family history, we now release the fire, fire of God on that timeline. And we say those lobby that are set to time, that are set to release curses, agendas, formations over the years to come. We break those off in Jesus' name. We speak death to those seeds of larvae that are in the minds of the people watching right now. And you keep decreeing, I have the mind of Christ, not in some panicked way of, I've got the mind of Christ, I've got the mind of Christ, get them off me. But no, decreeing with faith, I have the mind of Christ, you have no hold on me, shift off in Jesus' name. Katrina hmm. Debs, war. Yeah, and just in the name of Jesus, we remove that veil. I'm seeing in the spirit like a, a gauzy veil over that blindness that refuses to see that this is a spiritual battle. That veil that says, this is not what, this isn't true, this isn't real. We don't have demons in our day and age. And I remove that spirit of blindness and deception in the name of Jesus. And we declare, as scripture says, we have one enemy and it is the kingdom of darkness. Your fight is not against flesh and blood. It is against the powers and the principalities and where that blindness has crept in and it has kept you from seeing who your true enemy is, where it has kept you in bondage because of your refusal to see that level of this demonic infiltration into our everyday life. I break that cycle. I break that blindness in the name of Jesus. And we come after that spirit mm. of criticism and skepticism. Mm. You will leave the church. You will leave our hearts. You will leave our minds and you will leave this church for we know who we belong to. And we know that we belong to a supernatural realm. And we know that that was, that was how we were created when we were in Eden. We were in that place of supernatural humanity and divinity working together. And so we remove that skepticism from us in the name of Jesus. All of that eye rolling stops in the name of Jesus leave you will go get out yeah and we and we say we say out loud that we break agreement 
with every deceiving spirit, just like mm. Katrina said, where even the ones that we recognize, but the ones that we don't recognize because we are given permission to be deceived. We break agreement with every deceiving spirit that is mind altering demons, controlling my thinking, controlling my thoughts. And we, we no longer give it permission to be there. And we mm. give permission to the fire of the Holy Spirit to burn right through. And we break every agreement that would stand and object to that fire burning all the way through every oh. part of my thinking, every part of my thought process, every part that controls my emotions and my ability to, to fully function in the fullness of who God has created my mind to be with a mind of Christ. So in the name of Jesus, where you are, wherever you are in the world, whether live or on catch up, I list the burning, consuming Holy yes. Spirit that you may come into a new Pentecost. And just as the tongues of fire burnt the brains of the first disciples so they could have a right alignment to steward the new thing and the extreme thing of God. So I list a burning to your brain right now that you may be burned internally that within you may be the thoughts and understandings of how to steward this new era of God with ease. And in the name of Jesus, I speak to generational mindsets. I speak to low-grade inherited thinking. I speak to the demonic maggots that are devouring you from the inside out. And I say no in Jesus' name. Those demons who teach you, those deceiving spirits those devils who want to indoctrinate you, I burn them in the name of Jesus off your mind. And I say, you are a mental and emotional demon-free zone. And I lust to you the mind of Christ. Come and think as he thinks. Come and see as he sees. Come and feel as he feels. Come and act as he acts. Amen. Well, we've done 160 four hours of par hour. We're on holiday now. Go and look at the archives if you miss us. We'll be back in August. And uh, I feel really privileged to have done this journey with many of you. And I know some of you have not missed a single episode. And your reports to us certainly are how we have been a rudder and a point of stability in a very difficult season in the earth. And we are grateful that you have done 164 episodes with us, ours and ours and ours. And we've poured ourselves out as best we know how. And we know that you are richer because of it. And we thank God that we have found each other during this time. And so we pray for you as we go uh, and as we rest, because we really need to rest, because we really believe that what's coming in August is so fresh and so different that we need to pause and then to come back and then prophesy and tell you all the things that we've heard. And you guys need a break as well. Uh, ready for the fire of God come August and this new season of power that you and I, uh, all of us are moving into. So uh, I want you to contend over these four weeks, five weeks when we're not on for the mind of Christ, that if you will do that homework, you will be ready to steward what God is doing uh, in this next season. I would say if you want to give to the ministry, we would really love your sewing. Uh, and this is a sewing, I think I'm asking you to sew for thank you. But I'm also asking you to sow as a, a giving into the legacy and the future of the prophets. And I'm asking you if we have blessed you that you would give because there is something in the giving that enables a reward of the prophets to come into your lives. And David has the link on the screen there. It's on the website. We don't do it through Facebook because people get very dubious about whether that's um, uh, legitimate. But you can jump immediately and I would urge you to sow. And uh, uh, I'm urging you to sow because I know what that does to your life 
of gaining a profits reward. So um, propheticscots.com, there, I think there, there's just a general giving page where you give into the ministry. I think there is a link on my page where you can give specifically to David and I, if you want to do that specifically to our family, that's a different link from the mass one. And I think some of the team, although I've not looked at it, actually have links that you can give to them personally. Certainly you can give to David and I personally, but it's more about sowing into the ministry and the legacy of the prophets. I don't often say that, but I really felt like we were in this place where God was asking some of you to sow for prophetic reward. So I will leave that thought with you. Bless you. Ooh, we're going to say goodbye for the last time in five weeks. Mwah. Thank you, guys. We utterly adore you. We couldn't do this without you. It'd be boring without your comments. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you.